Good evening. My name is Taryn Riera. And my name is Emily. And this evening, we are pleased to introduce Naomi Andre, who is presenting Womanhood and Blackness and Gershwin's Porgy and Bess as part of tonight's Humanities Institute's Feminisms and the Radical Imagination lecture series. Naomi Andre is currently an Associate Professor of Women's Studies, the Department, wait, sorry. <laughs> Department of Afro-American and African Studies and the residential, at the Residential College at the University of Michigan. She re received her bachelor's degree in music from Barnard College and her master's and PhD in musicology from Harvard University. Her research focuses on opera and the issues that surround gender, voice, and race, and she has published articles on topics including Italian opera, women composers, and the teaching of opera in prisons. Professor Andre's two books, Voicing Gender, Castrati, Trafesti, and The Second Woman in Early 19th Century Italian Opera, and Blackness in Opera, both explore constructions of gender, race, and identity with that, within opera in the 19th to mid-20th mid centuries. Her current research interests extend to opera today in the United States and South Africa. We would also like to remind our guests that during the lecture, you are invited to tweet using the hashtag HISpring14 and that you can leave the survey cards, which you should have received at the door, on the table in the lobby on your way out. And now at this time, let's please give a warm welcome to Professor Naomi Andre. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation, for that warm um, introduction, as well as for the invitation to be a part of this series, Feminisms and the Radical Imagination, here at Scripps College at the Humanities Institute. It is really a pleasure to be here. And thank you for coming out. I know it's not always easy to get out in the evening after, in the beginning of a, um, of a week. Okay, so you, you know all about the Twittering stuff. <laughs> George Gershwin was born in 1898 in Brooklyn, New York, and died unexpectedly at the young age of 38 from a brain aneurysm in 1937. One of his last and most important works was Porgy and Bess that premiered in 1935. His untimely death has led to several questions about poor Guillebes, questions I am nearly positive that Gershwin would have undoubtedly addressed when he revisited this work, had he lived on to, subsequent, to see subsequent productions of the opera. Porgy and Bess was the first work to engage an almost exclusively black cast in the 1930s that continues in various versions up to the present day to be a pivotal work that features black performers and a story about black people in the United States. From its premiere in 1935 up through the present, Porgy and Bess has mobilized integrated audiences and says something important about how black people have been and continue to be configured in an ever-changing American consciousness. Turning to the high profile recent production on Broadway in 2011-2012 that is on tour in the U.S., Porgy and Bess is currently being presented in a so-called post-racial society that has seen affirmative action instituted, accepted, and now challenged. And just as a, a small aside, coming from Michigan with our proposal too, and saying this in California, knowing um, what you have gone through after Proposition 209, I feel this last point quite potently. The messages of Porgy and Bess provide a cautionary tale from the past, a yardstick for poor urban and rural centers today, and a lurking fear for the future. Through various modifications to the story and music, the new version updates the work in ways that resonate differently with contemporary audiences. A picture emerges that highlights the situation that the experiences of racially diverse audiences and performers shape and provide multiple layers of meaning in Porgy and Bess over time. My goal here is to ask questions about Porgy and Bess in terms of things that are generally not focused on by scholars, but are very much a part of the, its life as a work, and as it is consumed by real people, us and the audience, who have gendered and racialized identities and bring diverse vantage points into the theater. 
I'd like to give a quick entree to how I got here um, into this project. This inquiry is part of a larger project I've been working on that looks at race and specifically blackness, how it has been represented in opera. As an African-American opera scholar, I found myself asking questions about representation when I saw that the opera stage is the last public arena in the United States where the practice of blacking up having non-black performers put on black face makeup. This is still going on. Moreover, this practice does not seem to get much attention despite the inflammatory responses it gets from other non-operatic venues. Say, if we had a non-black actor black up for the title role in Shakespeare's Othello. I'd like to show a couple of um, PowerPoint slides just to get a sense of, of what this looks like. I'm a little slow with this, so I will get it. There we go. <laughs> okay, some of you might recognize some of these singers. This is Birgit Nilsson, a Swedish soprano, died um, several years ago, but was singing at the Metropolitan Opera till she retired in the early 1980s. Here she is blackened up as Aida, in the title role in Giuseppe Verdi's 1871 opera, Aida. Here is um, Placido Domingo, who is still alive and singing today. Early in his career, he was a tenor who had an incredibly strong um, top, uh, top of his range. And here uh, he's singing, he's dressed as the role for the title character in Verdi's Otello. The, um, the opera premiered in 1867 and, excuse me, 1887, and here's a performance from uh, the Metropolitan Opera in 1979, early in his career. Here we go a little bit later. Also, Domingo Azatello, this is from um, the early 80s. Here, I have several of um, Atello characters, um, sort of with the continuity, and also I've done a lot of work on Atello. Here we've got Ben Hepner, a singer who is still singing today, and Barbara Fritoli. Um, and she's Desdemona, he's Otello, and this is from 2010, excuse me, 2004. I'm sort of learning how to be on the mic and also look and juggle these things. Okay, and here's a picture of Johan Botha, who is a South African singer, and there's a really interesting situation where some of you might be familiar, or hopefully all of you are familiar with the Metropolitan Opera High Definition um, broadcasts of part of their season. Um, usually it starts around December and goes through, there's still a few more left through the end of their season in April. Then they have summer encore performances. This is a performance still from the, um, the Opera House, but this was an opera that was in high definition. I have a project where I'm looking at opera in South Africa after um, apartheid was dismantled in um, 1994. Johan Botha is an Afrikaner, South African singer, and I just happened to be able to see this opera in the Met at the Movies, as I call them, the Metropolitan Broadcast on HD with my South African, who's Zulu and Swazi, a black South African collaborator, Brenda Malambi. And it was very interesting to watch this with her as an African, a black African woman, seeing a white Afrikaner um, put on blackface to sing Otello. There was just sort of interesting dynamics that are still happening and going on today. And then I thought I'd show you a, a picture. This is Francesco Tamagno, who was the original Otello that Verdi wrote for in 1887. So this practice of having, he was not African, he's Italian. This practice of having, of blacking up, goes to the um, original performances of this opera. And then I thought I'd add um, a contemporary picture. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. This is an Austrian, a German comic, Christy Stefan at the Vienna Opera Ball just last month at the end of February. This is from um, the picture and the little quotation is from the Huffington Post I found online where Kim Kardashian had been invited to the Vienna Ball and um, 
Chris Steven thought that it might be, I don't know, funny or something to appear in blackface, um, quote, mimicking Kardashian's fiance Kanye West. So even, I, I hope you can tell that this is not, that he has blackface on, that this is not his real um, coloring. So even today, it seems that sometimes these things happen. This did get a lot of press, especially on the internet. However, had something like this happened in the United States, I don't know if it would have, but had it happened, I know it would have gotten, it would have been explosive. Oh man. Um, I just don't want to have that image up there. It's the, the, I know these images are, are distressing. Okay, let me talk a little bit about my recent and current projects that puts this black face and blackness in opera, further contextualizes it. Blackness in Opera is actually a collection of essays I co-edited that looks at operas by black and non-black composers that treat subjects which involve black people um, as well as, so black composers, non-black composers writing about black subjects. So great examples are Verdi, Zaida, and Otello from the 19th century, as well as 20th century Scott Joplin's Tremonisha, um, Clarence, White, uh, Clarence Cameron White's Awanga from the early uh, 1920s, and the volume goes up to Otto Preminger's 1954 film, Carmen Jones. This was a black setting of Bizet's opera, Carmen. And for those of you who are fellows in the seminar, I'm actually going to be talking about different settings of Bizet's um, Carmen tomorrow. Currently, I am working on a book that looks at recent operas, more recent than 1994, that um, open up a new narrative for how historical events around slavery and beyond are told. It's this retelling of black experience in the United States that rewrites central events in black history and puts the Atlantic slave trade and slavery, Jim Crow, and the civil rights era into a context that distance itself from this blackface and minstrelsy and instead showcases heroism and the humanity of African Americans. These works include topics around the early 19th century relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, the Amistad slave ship that landed in the coast, on the coast of the United States and became a court case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court in 1841, the Jim Crow South in the 1930s, and Malcolm X and the Civil Rights Movement. In this new book, my focus is on five operas and Okay, that just lists the operas and the chronological order in which they were written. So there's Anthony Davis, the only African-American composer, sadly the only African-American compos composer who's getting major commissions from major opera houses. His first opera from 1986, X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, was not um, commissioned. It was his first opera, and that's a hard uh, commission to usually get. But it was premiered, uh, or it was performed at the uh, New York City Opera, which has sadly just gone out of business. And there is a um, CD of the recording, not a DVD, but at least a CD so it can live on, and you can listen to it if you're interested. Anthony Davis has written several operas, though his other opera on black topics is his 1998 Amistad opera. William Bolcom and Sandra Seaton um, in 2001 have a work for solo soprano and piano that most of us would think of as a song cycle, but they've both referred to it as a solo opera, and that's from the Diary of Sally Hemings. That's the Jefferson-Sally Hemings relationship. And Richard Daniel Poor and Toni Morrison's um, 19, or excuse me, 2005 Margaret Garner. If you um, probably remember, Toni Morrison is the author of the novel Beloved from 1987, and she collaborated with the composer Daniel Poor to work on this opera. The opera was, um, it's had somewhat of a life. Um, after its premiere, always a big thing for new operas. It was a triple premiere uh, commission with Detroit, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh operas. It premiered, the world premiere was in Detroit. I got to see that run. Then it came back in, I think it was 2008, and occasionally it gets performed um, 
around the country. It's a really strong work. And George Gershwin and Debose Haywood's 1935, and then the revival in 2001, The Porgy and Bass. As you can see, Porgy and Bass is positioned as a type of bookend opera, with the opera premiere in 1935, and then this new version from 2011 with, as a Broadway musical. First premiered um, in 35, I am interested in how this work has generated meaning since its premiere and up through the present into the recent 2011-2012 revival in Broadway with Audra McDonald, where she won her fifth Tony as um, Bess, Norm Lewis, and many other wonderful singing actors. This production is actually currently on tour with different performers than the original Broadway cast. I was fortunate enough to see the production on Broadway Way twice in the summer of 2012, and then just earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago, while it was on tour at the Michigan Opera Theater in Detroit. The show will be, if you're at all interested, and I'm not trying to advertise this in any sense of my own gain, the show will be in LA at the um, Amundsen Theater on April 22nd through June 1st of this year. So if you have a desire to see this most current version as a musical, um, it's a great show to see. I'd like to say just a couple of basic points about Porgy and Bess before I move into certain topics, but I don't want to assume that people know this opera really well, though if you do, that's terrific. Uh, Porgy premiered at the Boston's Colonial Theater on September 30th, 1935, but had a New York opening, and um, its full first run was at the Alvin Theater, a theater on Broadway, on October 10th. Um, 1935. The singers comprised of an all-black cast with a few sing white singers for the few white roles, such as the detective, the coroner, and the policeman. Todd Duncan was the porgy. He was a classically trained singer, and he was the first black man to sing a large role at New York City Opera in 1945. He sang Canio in Leon Cavallo's I Pagliacci. Most people think of the color barrier being broken in major opera houses in um, 1955 when Marian Anderson sang Ulrika in Verdi's opera Un Ballo in Mascara, The Masked Ball. However, Todd Duncan, our first porgy, actually sang a major role at a major opera house a few years, 10 years earlier in 1945. Anne Brown, a 22-year-old Juilliard graduate, was Bess. Um, she was classically trained and decided after um, singing in several porgy versions into the 50s that she moved to, wanted to leave the United States. It was hard to have a career here as a black singer even after Marian Anderson broke the color barrier. And so she lived in Norway for most of her life and, um, and she just died in 2009. Eva Jesse was the choral director for the opera and had one of the leading black choirs of the time, the Eva Jesse Chorale. The University of Michigan, my home institution, has custodianship of many of um, items from her estate. And it was from this collection, the Eva Jesse collection, that initially got James Standifer, who's now Professor Emeritus of Music Education, interested in Porgy and Bess and all these materials. And he made a documentary Porgy and Bess, an American Voice in 1999, and later I'll be showing clips from this documentary. Porgy and Bess ran for 124 performances at the Alvin. It closed on January 25th and 36, and then toured Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Washington, D.C. until March of 36. Now, though 124 successive performances of a single opera in New York can hardly be called a failure by most standards, it was considered a box office failure because it lost all of its initial $70,000 investment. This is 1930s depression dollars. And the financial backers actually didn't make any money. Coupled with, so it was a controversial work, and then coupled with Gershwin's untimely death in 1937, it prevented him from going back to this production and working out details for what might have led to one or two final versions of the work, one for Broadway and or one for the Opera House. 
as it is now, we have a version from 1935-36 that Gershwin oversaw, and this was that first initial run. It's hardly definitive, though, since he wrote too much music and things were cut during the rehearsal period as well as after the premiere. So we don't have a critical edition yet of Porgy and Bess. Wayne Shirley, the former um, music director at the Library of Congress, has been working on one, and I think a definitive version of the opera version, Porgy and Bess, is, um, might come out soon. We have several other versions posthumous to Gershwin's death, a musical, a film, an opera and a, a film, another film <laughs> that er originally aired on TV. So let me just walk through some of these different versions of Porgy and Bess and talk about which ones sort of signal out which ones I'll be referring to and what we'll be talking about further. So there's the first version from 1935-36 that Gershwin oversaw. Then there are various musical versions that were performed in the 40s through the 1960s. These operas, these were more like musicals where the recitative sections, the parts that are sung between numbers in opera, were cut and spoken dialogue was put in there. And there are several of these productions that became very popular. The Samuel Goldwyn movie version was directed by Otto Preminger, yes, that same director who did Carmen Jones in 1954, later in 1959 made a movie version of Porgy and Bess with an all-star cast, Sidney Portier, Dorothy Dandridge, Sammy Davis Jr., Diane Carroll, Pearl Bailey, and many others. Uh, Maya Angelou also appears as a dancer in an uncredited role. Interestingly, for the singers, particularly um, the two lead singers, Porgy, who was Sidney Portier, that was dubbed by African-American opera singer Robert McFerrin, though he mainly had a concert career since he wasn't able to sing in operas because they were segregated, as well as African-American Adele Addison, who dubbed Dandridge's voice for Bess. Now, this film from 1959 is impossible to see. It's been recalled by the Gershwin estate, the Gershwin family, and unless you can find it in an archive, and of course, you guys being so close to LA, it's probably not super hard, but um, that's, it's not commercially available anymore. And I think it's because the um, family might have found it offensive or for some reason, but I just put that out there. There's the Glyndebourne production. Glyndebourne is an opera, um, very elite, wonderful opera company outside of London in England. They did a stage production that later went to Covent Garden, the premier opera house in London, that then was made into a TV version, and that's available on DVD. So we'll be watching scenes, a scene from that later on. But I just wanted to give you a sense of when we say Porgy and Bess, there's no one version. And it's not only an opera, and it's not only a musical, but it has elements of both, I would argue. Okay, Gershwin's Porgy and, Gershwin called Porgy and Bess American music, and he called it a folk opera. He discussed his ideas and motivations for the work in an article he wrote, Rhapsody on Catfish Row, Mr. Gershwin tells of the origin and scheme for his music in that New York folk opera called Poor Game Bass, long title, for an article in the New York Times that was printed in October 20th, 1935, just 10 days after the New York City premiere. Now, though these might sound like helpful labels, all of these terms, American music, folk, and opera, were not straightforward in the 1930s. I need a little further explanation here. American music, the question I'm going to ask is, what is American music in 1935? American music, as opposed to European music, was still in the early stages of defining itself and figuring out what a classical or art music was at the time of Porgy and Bess in the mid-1930s. Though Gershwin started out as a Tin Pan Alley songwriter, his move into more serious forms of music has given him a special place in early 20th century American musical identity. It's his combination of things, of popular 
quote unquote, lowbrow songs and shows, along with more serious highbrow rhapsodies and concertos. If you might remember, there's this Rhapsody in Blue from 1924 and the Concerto in F from 1925. This gets at the heart of what American music was developing into, finding a new homegrown voice that was not dependent upon Europe. Yet this combination of things, especially when it brought in elements of black music, such as jazz and the blues, was something that conflicted with what an American musical sound should be, at least in some people's minds. In the 1930s, jazz and blues was, were still considered rather subversive musical forms that were associated with lower class society and negative sides of black identity. And many people thought this, both white and black people felt that jazz and the blues were something that were connected with brothels and gaming houses. The artistry and skill in jazz and the blues were not generally appreciated until much later, beginning decades later in the 1960s and 1970s and in the, the position that we think of today. So Gershwin was pushing the comfort zone of respectable society and when he announced that his use of black music was part of an indigenous American musical voice. Well, let's ask, what is opera in 1935? With the death of Giacomo Puccini in 1924, the grand opera tradition came to a close as the composer of La Boheme from 1896, Madama Butterfly in 1904, and his last opera, Turandot, that was left incomplete at his death. The style and tradition of opera as it originated in Italy is seen to have ended. Though Richard Strauss was still writing operas in Germany in the 1930s through his death in 1949, the situation with the Third Reich in Germany impeded the circulation of his later operas until after his death. This is not to say that there have not been important operas written in the 20th century that have become canonical. British composer Benjamin Britten, who was born in 1913, began an important career with his first full-length opera, Peter Grimes, in 1945, and he wrote many more until his last opera, Death in Venice, from 1973, that premiered a few years before he died in 76. Italian-American composer Giancarlo Menotti, who was born in 1911, had his first major triumph in his chamber opera, The Medium, from 1947, and continued this success with his full-length opera, The Consul, in 1950. Some of you might know some of these operas or these composers, but just to let you know what was happening. Minolti also wrote the extremely popular um, first opera ever written for American television, Amal and the Night Visitors, at, that was first televised on Christmas Eve, 1951. Yet this situation leaves the 1930s opera scene open for new voices. Coupled with the desire to find an American voice in classical art music, Gershwin's Porgy and Bess fills a gap that was noticed. Even the highly experimental collaboration between Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson, this is the Four Saints and Three Acts, which premiered with an all-black cast in 1934, the year before Porgy and Bess, that did not lead to many future performances or a new direction in opera. For those of you who um, know Four Saints and Three Acts, it's um, an opera with a rather experimental, non-narrative, kind of bizarre text where the thought of using black actors, black bodies in the roles, came to Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson after the whole work had been written. And so the identity of black people singing this opera is only because they decided to put it together and it's not necessarily on black subjects. So let's talk about the folk. Um, and the American folk opera. Gershwin began his New York Times article, quote, since the opening of Poor Game Bess, I have been frequently asked why it is called a folk opera. The explanation is a simple one. Poor Game Bess is a folk tale. Its people naturally would sing folk music. When I first began work on the music, I decided against the use of original folk material because I wanted the music to be all of one piece. Therefore, I wrote my own spirituals and folk songs. But they are real folk music. And therefore, being an operatic form, Poor Game Best becomes a folk opera. 
In this oft-quoted excerpt, Gershwin seems to be saying two things at once. The music is real folk music, yet he also admits that he wrote all of his own original folk songs and spirituals. And I'm not the first to notice this, obviously. Um, Professor Emeritus of Musicology, Richard Crawford, a noted American musicologist, writes about this claim with Gershwin um, writing uh, folk music as an example of fake lore. Fake lore, a term coined by Richard Dorson in 1950, where, quote, the raw data of folklore is falsified by invention, selection, fabrication, and similar refining processes for capitalist gain, end quote. The use of folk in Gershwin's descriptive phrase about the work is especially rich with meaning. In the 1930s, the term folk had multiple references. One arena that has been explored by scholars is the conversation around the folk as coming out of the European context. And it might be helpful to see this in the context that George and Ira Gershwin were first generation Russian Jews whose parents had emigrated from Russia. Richard Crawford carefully outlines the use of folk as Broadway folk dramas, the rural urban divide of how folk music reflects community life, the development of Amer and the development of the American Folklore Society in 1888, and the efforts of the U.S. government to collect folk music before World War I, which were increased in the 1930s Depression. Crawford says they're seeking to shore up national identity during economic hard times, the sponsored folk-related projects, and he's also referring to the federal music project that started around this time. Ray Allen, a professor at Brooklyn College, has also looked into the varied associations of the folk in his thoughtful article, An American Folk Opera, Triangulating Folkness, Blackness, and Americanness, and Gershwin and Haywood's Porgy and Bess. Here, Allen explores more of the meanings of folk in black culture and mentions W.E.B. W. E. Du Bois's 1903, The Souls of Black Folk, Alain Locke's Formation of the New Negro, and the discourses around the spirituals as embodying an elevated form of black music in the Harlem Renaissance writing. Allen, um, Ray Allen brings the black and non-black folk together at the end of his article and argues that Porgy and Bess helped elevate southern blacks on the national forefront as folk. Near the end of his article, Allen writes, quote, quote, the door had cracked open for the spiritual singing folk of Catfish Row, he's referring to Porgy and Bess, to take a seat at the table where they might dine with Steinbeck's wandering Okies, Alan Lomax's singing cowboys, Henry Ford's fiddling hillbillies, and Grant Wood's stoic farmers, who had come to embody a deep and distinctly American mythos during the tough time of the Great Depression, end quote. I would like to extend the thinking about the folk to explore a larger context. One of the complications in writing about this work is the difficulty in finding a trenchant way to think about blackness. Too frequently, it seems that the issues have been framed around the dichotomous inquiry, is Porgy and Bess racist or not? And this question usually encompasses the assumed narrative that the all-white team of George and Ira Gershwin, along with DeBose Haywood, who had written the novel Porgy in 1925 and had been involved with the libretto for the opera, that this all-white team wrote about black Southern life from their white vantage point. And I have a nice picture. <laughs> of um, George Gershwin, DeBose Haywood, and Ira Gershwin, taken from the time A Round of Porgy and Bass. <clears throat> Excuse me. I find this binary construction to be rather unhelpful because it feels like a weak assessment of the situation. From my own vantage point, it seems to me to be clear and rather obvious that there are many very racist things about Porgy and Bass. The representation of black life in the 1920s, this is the time setting for the opera, reinforces many negative stereotypes. Additionally, the story presents a black community that gambles, kills each other, and succumbs to dangerous drunken and drug-induced behavior. What I'm also going to do, I 
I'm going to put up a structure, a PowerPoint that outlines a little bit, uh, or outlines the whole structure of the opera. There we go. And um, mention some of the numbers. I'm gonna have this up for a little while, so hopefully you can sort of go between listening as I'm talking about some of these really difficult moments in the opera. You can see a bit where they're placed. So the story presents a black community that gambles, kills each other, and succumbs to dangerous, drunken, drug-induced behavior. The few characters that show hope, such as the religious Serena, who has high morals, suffers the loss of her husband, Robbins, in the first scene when Crown kills him over a craps game. The most promising family of Jake, who's a self-employed fisherman, and Clara, who sings Summertime in the opening to their little baby, um, who has such a bright future in the beginning of the opera, that wonderful family unit of Jake, Clara, and their little baby is decimated when both parents are killed in the hurricane at the end of Act Two. Their little baby is um, abandoned by Bess when she leaves Catfish Row in disgrace at the end of the opera. In addition to these troublesome issues around representation, to say that a white creative team created a black opera does not tell the full story. DeBose Haywood was from Charleston, South Carolina, and though his family was not as financially prominent as it had been, he could trace his ancestors back to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Haywood came from deep roots in a well-heeled Southern white ancestry. Conversely, George and Ira Gershwin were born to Russian Jewish parents who immigrated to the United States. In addition to their fairly recent immigrant status as their Jewish ethnicity that was not considered white at that time, anti-Semitism and negative stereotypes about Jews, some of which were similar to those same negative stereotypes associated with blacks, were prejudices, and Jewish people in the United States suffered discrimination in the 1920s and 30s, and sadly beyond. An arena that I have not seen in the Porgy and Bess literature, and one that I plan to further explore, is the background to the richness of the interactions between blacks and Jews in the 19-teens, 20s, and 30s. At this time, Yiddish musicals, jazz, and klezmer music were circulating alongside each other in popular culture. This history might give further information about Gershwin's desire to set the story of Porgy and his apparent comfort in working with blacks at, um, at this time. Now, however, on the other hand, even I must acknowledge that there are many things to love about Porgy and Bess. While I talk about the difficulty of representa representation and how, you know, asking the question of is it racist by today's standards, of course it is. There are things that are really um, incredible and wonderful about Porgy and Bess. Most of the tunes are already familiar through jazz standards. Summertime, I Got Plenty of Nothing, Bess You Is My Woman Now. And Gershwin's music has that perfect combination of an undulating Puccini-esque lyricism with catchy syncopations that capture the rhythms of the English language so well. Gershwin's music achieves many things at once. It involves full-out operatic singing, yet still has moments that feel like a spontaneous outpouring of emotion. Serena's My Man's Gone Now at the funeral of her husband in Act One showcases operatic virtuosity and brings on chills of a new widow's wail. The O oh, Dr. Jesus chorus during the second act hurricane makes you feel like you've walked into a black church vigil. Gershwin's insistence on a black cast makes going to Porgy and Bess a unique experience and one especially exciting for black audiences. For practically nowhere else in the operatic repertory do we have the chance to see so many black people on stage and in the audience of the opera house. You go to a production of Porgy and Bess and you're going to see an incredibly integrated audience. And I can guarantee this because where the Porgy and Bess is performed is almost always in urban centers where there's a large African-American um, population and they will turn out um, usually dressed really well <laughs> to performances of Porgy and Bess. I wanna talk about the specter of minstrelsy, which I've alluded to and mentioned. 
a central issue that links the representation of race and gender in poor and Bass is the history of minstrelsy in the United States. Begun in the 1820s and popular through the 1950s, minstrelsy is a pernicious way of organizing visual and cultural stereotypes about black people in the United States, and its legacy can still be felt today. In terms of poor and Bass, there are two connections I would like to make. The first is the popular origin myth of how minstrelsy began, and the second is the specific images that have been borrowed and that lie beneath the surface of several of the characters. Though the beginning of, beginnings of minstrelsy as a practice has been written about and traced back to popular vaudeville and variety popular theater in the 19th century, one of the most common origins of minstrelsy connects back to an Irishman named Thomas Dartmouth Rice, also known as T.D. Rice. Several sources have identified T.D. Rice, who is a traveling actor, as encountering a, a crippled black man, a slave, a stable man, the legends vary. And this crippled black man was dressed shabbily and singing about Jim Crow. T.D. Rice decided to imitate the crippled black man on stage as one of his acts by dressing in tattered clothes, blacking up his face with burnt cork, and doing a dance that has the famous refrain, wheel about and turn about and do it just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Though T.D. Rice was not the first blackface performer, his Jim Crow performances in the late 1820s became so popular that he's become associated with the early stages of this whole style. In an interesting coincidence, or perhaps something more connected. In exploring the impetus for DuBose Haywood to write his Porgy novel, I came across an off-sided paragraph from the court proceedings of the Charleston News and Courier. In the introduction to the 1928 edition of Porgy the Play, and the play was written in 1927 by both DuBose Haywood and his wife, Dorothy Haywood, Haywood, uh, DuBose Haywood writes about his influences and inspiration for the novel. And he, in this introduction, he cites the court proceedings. Quote, Samuel Smalls, who is a cripple and is familiar to King Street with his goat and cart, was held for the June term of court of sessions on an aggravated assault charge. It is alleged that on Saturday night, he attempted to shoot Maggie Barnes at number four Romney Street. His shots went wide of the mark. Smalls was up on a similar charge some months ago and was given a suspended sentence. Then later, right after this, in the introduction, so DuBose writes in prose, here was something amazing. I had been familiar with the tragic figure of the beggar making his rounds of the Charleston streets. Thinking in terms of my own environment, I had concluded that such a life could never lift above the dead level of the commonplace. And yet, this crushed serio-comic figure over on the other side of the color wall had known not only one, but two tremendous moments. Into this brief paragraph, one could read passion, hate, and despair. Inquiry on my part added only one fact to the brief newspaper quote. Smalls had attempted to escape in his wagon and had been run down and captured by the police patrol, end quote. As a side note, this wagon was a gold-pulled cart that was used in the Poor Game Best Play from 1927, and it made its way into some productions of Poor Game Best, the opera. So hence, the characters behind the so-called beginning of minstrelsy as a genre and the specific inspiration that led to the source for Gershwin's Poor Game Best turn out to be two crippled black men, crippled black men. What was that it? <laughs> what was it that around 90 years apart, the 1820s for T.D. Rice and minstrelsy, and the 1920s for DuBose Haywoods and uh, Porgy, a, crib, a genre and then a source for one of the most con contested American operas would come out of such similar roots, crippled black men whose plights were taken up by white men who were fascinated by them. Was it their exotic foreignness? Was it ridicule? Was it the connection of humanity? Maybe, perhaps a combination of all of these things. 
Returning to Thomas Dartmouth Rice, the character he developed, Jim Crow, also evolved into Sambo and Uncle Tom, the stereotype of the docile and not very intelligent black men who were seen as harmless, sang, danced, and smiled a lot. And here we get the roots behind the enterprise of minstrelsy. Other negative characters that developed out of this tradition were the buck, a large threatening black man who only wanted to rape women, preferably white women, and the trickster, who could also be called Zip Coon. This is a mischievous and dangerous character who brings trouble and cheats people out of their material possessions and honor. In terms of women, the two most common minstrel roles are the Mammy and the Jezebel. The Mammy was the large black woman who took care of white families, cooking and cleaning, while her own family fended for itself. The Jezebel, the final character I'll mention, is a highly sexualized black woman who tempts all men, especially white men, and loves to be sexually used. In Porgy and Bess, these minstrel character types lie close beneath the surface of many characters. Porgy is the Sambo, Crown is the Buck, and Sport and Life is the Trickster. While Mariah has elements of the Mammy, Bess is clearly born out of the Jezebel. What, and finally, I'm moving more into issues around womanhood and feminism um, and Porgy and Bess. What is at stake in thinking about Porgy and Bess as an American folk opera, an embodiment of minstrel stereotypes, and an intersection of modern day race, class, and gender dynamics when the work is performed today? And I'm, pretty, I'm very interested in both the opera performance as well as the musical uh, performances. And I'll be using the current on tour, um, the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess um, as an example of the musical. While the opera comes from Du Bois Haywood's 1925 novel Porgy and the play Porgy that Do uh, Dorothy Haywood adapted in 1927, the opera was called Porgy and Bess and increases the voice of Bess as a more central character. Musically, she does not have a full-blown solo like Porgy, but she has important numbers with the chorus and significant sections of solo singing and duets with Porgy and Crown. In comparison to the other women in the opera, Bess is the only character that evolves, changes, and develops over time. The other women have specific roles that they fulfill, and yet they remain a bit static in terms of change. Clara opens the opera with summertime, the lullaby of the new mother and devoted wife, who is part of a stable family unit with her fisherman husband, Jake. When Jake gets caught in the hurricane, Clara blindly follows him into the storm, unable to think of anything besides the family unit, even when it costs her own life. She is the highest soprano voice, has a light voice that represents both her youth and relative innocence, as well as naivete. Serena is the devoted wife of Robbins, who has a strong religious code and mourns her husband in My Man's Gone Now, when Crown kills Robbins in a drunken stupor over an argument about the craps game. Serena is a heavy soprano voice that illustrates her older age than Clara, but still a woman in the prime of life. Mariah is the older matron who holds the community together. She owns a small restaurant business and is the de facto leader to whom people look when anyone is in trouble. Mariah has a mezzo-soprano voice that shows her older age and commanding authority. Bess, our character Bess, is the abused, drug-addicted girlfriend of Crown. She is the soprano that is heavier than the light voice of Clara and not quite as heavy as Serena, though musically she very much holds her own. Bess's vocal line soars in her love duet with Porgy and becomes a bona fide operatic heroine as they declare their love and fidelity to each other. Yet Bess's vocal role also gets more muscular and heavier in the scene with Crown on Kidawa Island after the picnic in Act Two. As she fights with him, her music grows more desperate as she tries to resist Crown's strength. Dramatically, we see three different phases of Bess's character. The opening character when she is first introduced and is associated with Crown, we then see the rehabilitated Bess, who gets over Crown, loves Porgy, and learns how to be a member of Catfish Row. She belongs to the community. 
after the scene with Crown on Kitua Island, Bess is never quite the same. And the strength of her writing is that she can be played in a couple of ways with different outcomes and interpretation. What I'd like to do, you've heard me talk for a long time, and I'd like to focus on a scene that we actually get to watch. The clip is um, a little under 10 minutes, and um, what I want to do is to watch the Glyndebourne production, the opera version, the Glyndebourne production is the opera version, and then we'll talk about the recent Broadway musical. Sadly, I cannot show that because it's not available, but I can certainly talk about that. So right now, I'd like to play the scene um, of um, on Kitawa Island with Crown. I also want to say, I know this is a tough scene to watch and discuss, and my apologies for needing to dwell here for a few minutes. There's some sexual tensions that are really complicated, so I'm uh, sorry to put us through this. Okay. <laughs> Well, this crowd, I've seen you land, and I've been waiting all day for see you. I'm a stain on this damn island. You ain't looks most dead, you speak of that evil. Oh, I got plenty to eat, but a goister in such. But I must stay of the looks of with not one God person to swap over with the eyes when you come. I can't stay crown on a boat go without me. Damn that boat! God, any happy dust with you. No crown, no more happy dust. Let's listen to all I got to tell you. I waitin' here till the cut begin coming in. Then living would be easy. Johnny'll hide you and me on the river boat. For Savannah, who are you living with now? I'm living with the cripple of Poggy. <laughs> Got funny taste in men, but that's your business. I ain't care who you take up with my eyes away. But remember what I told you. He's temporary. I reckon it'll be just a couple of weeks now. I comes for you. Crown, I got something to tell you. What that? Get plenty of them with me. Oh, I 
woman, and that's you, see? Okay. In the opera, let me just give you a little background, which I probably should have done. Bess is with the community. They've all gone to Kittawa Island for a picnic after Saturday, uh, Sunday church services. And while she goes back, the boat's coming to bring them back to Catfish Row. She's going, she forgets something, runs back, and there's Crown, who's been on the island. Crown was banished from Catfish Row after he kills Robin in the first, uh, Jack Robbins in the first scene. And so the police wouldn't find him. He's hiding out on Kittawa Island. So he's been 
woman hiding there, and Bess is there, he finds her, and then we have that scene. The final scene we see here in this um, film production uh, from the Glyndebourne production in the early 90s is the boat going back to Kitawa Island and the focus was on Mariah, the sort of leader of, the, of Catfish Row, the community, and she's waiting for Bess and doesn't see her and, and sort of knows that something bad is going on. Okay, in the opera, this scene can look like Bess is capitulating to Crown's advances. Despite her love of Porgy, she cannot get over Crown. Or it can look like Crown is forcing himself on Bess as a full-out rape. There's no consent from Bess. A possibility, a third possibility, is that it leaves doubt as to which is the case, whether it's consent by Bess or rape. And I think this Glyndebourne production, although we can certainly talk about this afterwards, it leaves, it sort of opens up this line where you could read it as Bess capitulating and finally giving in to Crown because she really loves him underneath still, or that she is saying no and she sort of capitulates because she knows she can't fight him. In the musical version, and again, I'm sorry I can't show you any of this, but how there were some liberties taken with the text. This was the um, Sue Ann Parks and Diane Paulos and uh, Sue Ann, oh, I can't believe I didn't write this down, but with Laurie Ann Parks and Diane Paulos, um, who a trio of black women who put the Gershwin's Porgy on Best currently on tour together. They, I think they did something very interesting that I haven't noticed in the opera productions I've seen. It feels as though Best definitely capitulates, but she hates herself for it. This damages her in such a way that she never fully gets over it. Even when she goes back to Porgy, he forgives her, and she says she wants to be with him. There is something broken in her, and you get the sense that she betrays Porgy at the end of the opera, not because sport and life has convinced her to be with him, but rather, since Kitawa Island, she no longer feels worthy of Porgy. In this musical, this is all the more poignant because there is an added scene after Bess comes back from Kitawa Island and the women bathe her and help her through the fever and recovery. In the opera, she's only seen with Porgy watching over her, but in the musical, one sees Bess more fully integrated into the community and the women have accepted her as one of their own. It thus feels that Bess is losing so much more in the musical version since she has the other women supporting her. We can certainly talk about this, but what I'd like to do before the very end is to play um, a clip from the Standifer documentary. This is Porgy and Bess, an American voice from 1999. And he, the um, whole um, VHS, which is the format it's in, I don't know if it's in um, DVD or I couldn't find it in DVD. It's only about an hour and 10 minutes and it's very interesting. And there's some wonderful footage, which I'm going to show you a bit of, with people, the first Todd Duncan and, um, uh, the first Porgy, Todd Duncan and Bess, Ann Brown, who died shortly after the um, film was made, the documentary was made. So it's just wonderful historical information. And it brings up some interesting points that, um, yeah, that we'll talk about a little bit more. I'm working on this. <laughs> How do I get away from the screen? I'm so sorry. Thank you. All right. Oops. <laughs> oh. So I'll finish. I'll bring this this one over for you. Yeah. And then, and then when I get back there, just hit play. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No problem. So just hit play when I get Once back. Once you get there. Great. Thank you. So this first clip will be Willard White, who um, had been one of the Porgies, and he uh, talks about seeing um, uh, 
different people, uh, seeing grown men cry when they go to Porgy. One thing I want you to get is that this documentary does so well, is it shows people directly connected with the performances of Porgy over time, and particularly African Americans, and it gives their very different voices on what they feel about this um, opera. Most of the scholarship has not looked or noticed this video, and instead looks at written reviews in the black press, which almost uniformly condemned the Porgy and Bess from 1935. These um, voices give us something a little different. Okay, I'm gonna push play. Hiding the fact that they are actually crying. And then at the very end of the piece, to see everybody spontaneously rising to their feet, which they've never seen at Glyndebourne before and they haven't seen since. This is a photo of the Porgy and Bess uh, Glyndebourne production. For a very long time. With the cast. With the very fine music of George and the excellent lyrics of, of Ira. When the singers, these great singers who had had so few chances to sing, when they put those two elements into those mouths, they elevated the music from very fine to great because of the singers, because of their need to sing, their ability to sing, their training, their devotion. They simply lifted it. If you just take, take a line like, Bess, you is my woman now, my being a black man, know that I, best you is my woman now. And I would just do that. I know to do that. I'm sorry, I'm not going to stop it too much just because it's so wonderful to watch, but I do want to make a couple of comments. You'll see later that this is Leontine Price at the beginning of her career in the 1960s um, when she sang the role of Bess. But another thing I want you to notice is how Porgy is depicted. In various productions, early on, he was just on his knees. That's how Todd Duncan sang him. And then here, by the time you get to the 60s, you have him on a cart that he wheels himself around in. Then you get, you'll, um, though you didn't see Porgy in the Glyndebourne production, but he's using a cane. And in the production that's currently touring with Norm, uh, excuse me, the role that Norm Lewis had played on Broadway, he has a cane and at one point he gets a brace to try to straighten his leg. So this whole portrayal of one of the big uh, criticisms of the Sydney port of the movie in 1959 was we don't want to see our black heroes like Sidney Portier literally on his knees singing. We want a more heroic role for him. So as we come up to the present, we see uh, Porgy going from his knees to a cart to then actually standing. Okay. I was first asked to play the role of Porgy back in 1952. Uh, Blevins Davis and Bob Green were putting on that production, and they presented to me that they were going to be sent by the State Department uh, to Europe, and then they were going to be on their own to go to very various places. They asked me to go with them up to Juilliard School of Music because there was a young lady by the name of Leontine Price that they wanted me to see. I 
did that first with Leontine on stage in rehearsal. At the end of it, all of us were just, she and I and the whole cast, it was just dead silence. And we knew that she was the best that was going to be Ralph No. Being best was already half of me. I mean, most of me anyway. It's a matter of sort of accident this or accident that. But there was little to prepare for. I don't mean saying that uh, the character itself. I mean being, uh, being wonderfully black, wonderfully uh, 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 uncampered by, you know, having to, I don't know, it's just it's sort of, it, I'm, I'm getting sort of excited thinking about, you know, like, uh, here I am, isn't it terrific, you know? We opened in Vienna. When we arrived, there was press and everything, and it was a glorious arrival. magnificent experience after the other. There was just screams and applause, the European way of stomping on the floor and so on and so forth. We must have taken about 15 curtain calls. I've always been convinced that human beings are more alike than we are unalike. And the trip to Europe with Porgy and Bess confirmed me in that belief. I learned that in primary research, and I learned that in the story of Porgy and Bess. There was no one who could resist that story. No one. Not the most sophisticated, not the communist, nor the capitalist. No one could resist the story. Marigold goers in Leningrad and Moscow see something new on the Soviet stage, Porgy and Bess played by a visiting American company in the traditional American way. 2,000 Russians pay up to $15 for tickets on the sellout opening night in Leningrad's Kirov Theater. After 13 appearances, the troupe goes to Moscow for 12 more. An American classic scores a hit, earning a 10-minute ovation on opening night in Russia. Moscow прибывали американские артисты. Они приехали из Ленинграда, где показали оперу «Порги и Бесс». Опера «Порги и Бесс», выдающегося американского композитора Джорджа Гершвина, где живет и Порги, коллега нищий. Леверн Хэтчерсон, исполнитель этой роли. Порги горячо любит легкомысленную девушку Бесс. В этой роли выступает Марта Флауэр. I joined the company the day that Leontine Price was leaving. I had been hired as a member of the chorus, and understudy to Clara, which was fine by me as long as I would have a chance to be on stage. We went to Egypt. Then we went to Rome, and we played there, and then to La Scala, which is the most beautiful opera house in the entire world, I believe. I'll never forget it. Porgy and Bess was sent to Europe by the State Department to show 
that we, that we were included in society. The story of Montgomery is a story of 50,000 Negroes who are tired of injustice and exploitation, who are willing to substitute tired feet for tired souls, and to walk and to walk and walk until the walls of injustice are crushed by the battering rams of historical necessity. America is emerging as a world power. The economy is booming. Whites and blacks are moving farther and farther apart. But at the same time, the civil rights movement is coming on center stage. America needs to send different kinds of signals abroad, doesn't it? It needs to show that, well, in spite of all of this turmoil and strife and all of this racism, this protest, whatever, our black people truly are happy. And if you want to see how happy they are, look at Porgy and Bess. It was in the year 1958 that I was approached to do Porgy and Bess. And my decision was not to do the film. Um, with the familiarity that I had with, with the uh, property, I thought it would be better not to make the film, to be quite honest with you. I really didn't see the purpose of making this film. I thought it was uh, a negative, that all of the characters were primarily a negative influence. At that time, I was married to a man who was a television producer. He had very strong convictions about my being in this film. And we discussed it. He asked me to look at it from a business point of view, which was, Diane, you need film. You need film so that you can show the film. And you need to make some sort of film impact so that it can uh, serve you well in your career. So that was a difficult decision for me to make. Uh, later, I realized, too, that there were many people who found this decision a difficult one to make. We had to juggle that line of, should this film be made? Should I be a part of it? Against, is it right for my career at this time? That move. I just love the richness of these portrayals and also how you have people, Maya Angelou, um, talking about the irresistible story. William Warfield, um, one of the early porgies, saying, as a black man, I know how to sing this music. Leontine Price, who says, Bess is just wonderfully me. It's, it's just incredible. And then you have Diane Carroll, who's saying, I didn't really want to make this movie in 1959, the one that has subsequently been withdrawn. I found it to be really um, problematic. And yet my husband said I needed the film exposure, so I thought, OK, maybe I'll do it. We can certainly talk about this more. Uh, um, and I'm just about done. I know I'm, I'm going over. OK. Over time, people have thought of Porgy and Bess as the great American opera, as well as a frustrating collection of stereotypes that emphasize a vision of black people who speak in a dialect-ridden English, drink and gamble too much, and have a loose moral code. And to some extent, both of these assessments are true. The opera touches on intensely human emotions that lead to both great passion and heart-wrenching devastation. Yet it is this music that touches us and gets under our skin in such a way that it feels like a part of you, as we saw in Leontine's Price discussion of singing Bess um, in the documentary. And yet this is what makes Gershwin's Porgy and Bess so easy to love and so difficult to stay mad at. Thank you.